So welcome again, everyone, um, to the, the webinar of uh, on the topic of reshaping international trade with trusted AI uh, and origin trail. We are going to be with you roughly an hour today. And uh, there's uh, three of us that are, are um, speakers at this webinar, myself. So Yuri, um, I'm the general manager at uh, Trace Labs. Uh, we're the core developers of Origin Trail. Uh, so we Origin Trail is a trusted knowledge infrastructure for AI applications, which we'll talk about in more detail uh, today. But joining me, I have uh, I have uh, two uh, two participants that are vastly more experienced than I am in the topic of supply chain. So we have uh, with us Ken. So Ken is uh, an uh, advisory board member at Transport Intelligence and the uh, managing <laughs> managing director at Virtual Partners. And he has over four decades of experience um, in, in the areas of information system logistics. Um, you know, he has expertise in freight forwarding, supply chain management, express shipping. So really all around supply chain, uh, a well-rounded supply chain expert. And uh, has worked also uh, with various government institutions, including uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, U.S. Department of Defense, and Government of Singapore. So, uh, and uh, Ken, happy to have you here. Also, Ken is one of our uh, advisors at, at Trace Labs. So thanks for, for joining in. Pleasure. Uh, and we have, uh, on the other hand, uh, David. David is a uh, principal consultant for uh, supply chain security, risk management, and resilience at the, the British Standards Institution, the BSI. Uh, he's also very experienced with over 25 years uh, of experience in supply chain industry, specializing in uh, risk management strategies. And he's also been involved and contributed to the contributed to programs such as the CTPAT and the ISO 28000. And we've been working with David for uh, the past couple of years quite uh, closely on, on a variety of uh, solutions that we've been developing together with uh, so Trace Labs and BSI. So welcome, David, as well. Thank you, Yuri. Pleasure to join the team. Uh, great. So that being said, just maybe a quick uh, quick introduction into uh, what we'll be talking about today. So the topic is international trade. What are the challenges and opportunities uh, that we that we see? Um, how can AI uh, or where is AI's potential really in global supply chains? And then we'll look, go dive deep into the trusted knowledge infrastructure that is origin trail that enables AI really to, uh, to, to reach its full potential. And we'll talk about uh, a lot of things, but the more, most exciting then component, of course, we'll be doing a uh, live demo showcasing how uh, how this can really impact, so how Origin Trail can really impact international trade and what potentials it, it unlocks. Now have a quick discussion and, and Q and A. So, but before going into uh, into into the weeds of it, maybe Ken and David, uh, if you guys have a couple of uh, say opening thoughts, remarks, I'll I'll hand the word to you. So maybe Ken, starting with you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Yuri, <clears throat> and good day, everyone. No matter where you're plugging in from. Um, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, as they say, uh, I was part of a team um, developing a global logistics business for one of the largest um, shipping companies, uh, logistics companies on the planet. And we designed and then operated uh, some of the most sophisticated supply chains on the planet at that time. This was in the um, mid to late 1990s. And we determined very quickly that one of the biggest problems was um, the lack of visibility. Now, keep in mind the parent company had uh, the largest track and trace operation there was on the planet at that time, <laughs> primarily due to their size. But because we were involved in manufacturing, shipping, um, and all manner of activities around logistics, just track and trace wasn't good enough. So we spent a fair amount of time developing a technology platform to improve the visibility into order management, warehouse management, and so on. After we, we also made lots and lots of mistakes, but at the end of the day, the, the operation was very successful, which is great. Um, that meant that informed my thinking about visibility is vital for any kind of inter international trading operation. And also, conventional the conventional approach to doing this, get everyone to submit data into a single database, would not work. <clears throat> it would only work on a federated basis 
and the various challenges around that, the various silos of data, not only in individual applications, but within individual companies that form a supply chain community. Most people don't appreciate that supply chains are actually communities, networks of companies, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands or ten thousands of companies. And trying to get information from any or all of those through a single um, mechanism, application or database was an impossible challenge. And that I've been trying to work out how to address that for a long time, given the advances in technology. I came across Origin Trail in 2017, just as I was starting, and I was astounded that the guys um, in Origin Trail had drawn the same conclusions as I had without the experience, lucky them, and uh, had come up with a way of actually making this happen. So hopefully this afternoon um, we'll be able to go through and you'll be able to see the power of what they've developed and how this can impact this challenge that I've just described. Thanks. Great, thanks, Ken. That's a that's a very uh, very good introduction into into what we'll talk about. So, looking forward to uh, to the discussion and uh, maybe David, a couple of words from your end as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I very much going to um, echo what Ken uh, has just said there, but from my point of view and in my experience, um, all model supply chains, you know, disruption, delays, costs, paperwork, risks uh, at every turn even in these um, ecosystems of uh, uh, different parts of the supply chain, challenging, challenging for everybody. Then you superimpose uh, post-pandemic uh, focus on geopolitical changes in supply chains, new legislation being introduced. Uh, for example, the um, German Supply Chain due, due Diligence Act, focusing on uh, addressing human human rights and uh, labour issues in supply chains. The EU quickly following up with their new Supply Chain Act. The UK introduction of the Electronic Trade um, Document Bill. Uh, the US focus on their CTPAT program, which has uh, uh, an element around sustainability. Um, you can see that uh, supply chains, global supply chains, are uh, you know trying to address um, tremendous challenges. However. To echo uh, Ken's point, I think that there are great opportunities and the opportunities to, to be really capitalized on are around improving visibility through tracing um, what's happening in your supply chain. So if you have visibility into your supply chain, you can make better decisions, you can manage risk better, you can improve your operations, you can improve efficiencies. And, um, uh, you know, working with uh, Origin Trail over the last couple of years, on uh, a number of different sector focused solutions, I can see that the opportunities are, are really there. And what we're going to be discussing today will hopefully bring that to light. And, um, you know, the penny will drop for very many, many, uh, many, many people watching. Um, it's really exciting. There is lots of opportunity. And, uh, you know, I think we are um, definitely heading in the right direction. So looking forward to sort of answering questions, but obviously uh, participating in the demonstration, Yuri. Thanks, David. Thank you both. Uh, yeah, I think you touched touched upon um, a lot of uh, a lot of topics that uh, kind of uh, are weaved into into all of the agenda items. And uh, the first one, right, the challenges and opportunities. You guys both mentioned a couple already. Um, you guys have a slightly um, so both both uh, deep in supply chains, right, both in logistics, but have slightly different angles uh, of of how you work. So, David, you're more from a security, Ken, you're also operational and also IT, uh, uh, IT uh, expert for, for a while. Where do you see um, the largest, let's say, challenges and opportunities that are, um, that are causing most of the issues that we mentioned before, right? So we mentioned, or you mentioned just now, so we have congested ports, um, spiraling costs, uh, environmental impacts, right, that need to be now mitigated through different, uh, uh, different, different, uh, from, from a legal side, right, for different legislation coming in. Where do you see this really, and maybe something that is um, also the most, let's say, the lowest hanging fruit that can be addressed to have the maximum impact from, you know, different perspectives that you guys have? You want me to go first? If you want, Kenya. you? Yeah. Um, from from my point of view, 
it's it's not so much the technology because the technology has advanced tremendously in this area, particularly over the past ten years. Um, with um, <clears throat> you know people really starting to exploit the power of connected networks and, and the internet, it's as much cultural uh, because within organisations uh, there, there's this tendency still to keep information within maintain it within silos um, and trying to share information when essentially what you really need to do is to share information because many, the velocity of products through supply chains has uh, increased dramatically until it hit the pandemic, which slowed everything down. But um, the fact that products move through supply chains very, very fast, particularly with um, the <clears throat> fast moving consumer goods, electronic components and so on, you need to know what's going on all the time. And lots and lots of data is now being collected electronically as opposed to on paper. And although that information has been collected, is it relevant? Does it have context? And can you exploit it when you get hold of it? But if a company or the culture inside an organization is very suspicious and doesn't like sharing, that makes that very, very challenging, particularly if they believe that it's going to be shared with a competitor even though there's good reasons to do that. So any mechanism that addresses those challenges and enables you to get the clearest picture of what's happening across your supply chain enables you to unleash all kinds of opportunities, gather insight, and essentially feed artificial intelligence and machine learning mechanisms that can augment decision-making at the highest levels. That leads to much improved sustainability, actions and essentially makes it a lower operating cost to run that supply chain because the cost of addressing screw-ups or accidents or problems in a supply chain far exceeds the cost of actually anticipating or being able to respond immediately that, that a challenge occurs. So that's really what I think that this 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 stuff can unleash. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yuri, if I can bring Ken's point to life, and I see it almost on a weekly, if not daily basis, when I'm engaging with clients, I'm generally engaging with clients uh, as, after an event occurs, a risk event occurs. Uh, unfortunately, on many occasions, that's a, a loss type event. So, uh, or, or, or a, um, you know, a, a spoilage type event. So to Ken's point about if we can, develop a culture or in, infuse within organizations to share information, share knowledge, they can make better decisions. So to bring, bring it to, um, to light, if you like. So imagine we have a shipment that's valued, I don't know, million pounds plus. Um, from a security and risk management point of view, the security guys really want to make sure that the appropriate measures are applied to that particular shipment to protect that shipment as, as it moves through the supply chain. The operations guys and the logistics guys are keen to make sure that, that it moves as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes that information is not shared. Not shared. So the risk guys are th saying, right, we need these measures. Uh, the ops guys are driven, maybe driven by other factors, including a cost factor. Uh, may say right, we want it moved quickly, but therefore we'll, we we will we'll compromise a little bit on the security. Net result is you have a loss. Then you're pulling in the financial people because they've got to do an investigation. They've got to try and trigger off the insurance, and uh, then you've got the client uh, relationships people because they've got the client on the line saying, "Where's my shipment? Where's my product?" Then you've got the operations guys trying to backfill this, so it causes innumerable problems from one to the one event. Now, if you had the ability to be able to share knowledge and information before shipment, for example, in that case, that example, right, it's a million pounds plus shipment that requires the following uh, measures of uh, security. And there's a discussion between, um, uh, on, and I'm talking about, um, um, you know, a, an automated discussion between an approvals process uh, between operations, logistics, and security, that they have the optimum security, the quickest movement for the client, etc. Um, then you mitigate a lot of those potential impacts. Uh, that can only be done, as Ken says, by sharing information, changing a culture, and you know. I think what we're going to demonstrate today is if if you construct it properly, then you have the ability to be able to do that. 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Bob. That that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I think uh, what what I get out of this, what you guys have just said, is also um, there are certain enablers, right? That that uh, enable enable the industry to move in that direction. Uh, you mentioned some of them, right? The culture, uh, the the uh, kind of the adoption of technology. But there are some things that are also um, being pushed from the uh, legislative part of uh, uh, of the industry, right? That are uh, a very good indicator that uh, uh, that enable essentially technology to really be deployed and used. So mm -hmm. I'm talking about uh, bills like the Electronic uh, um, Document Trade Bill or now Act in in the UK that uh, really allow right because before that legally you needed to have uh, all of the things also on paper, which is not you know only mentioning the confusion that causes and the extra work uh, if if you want to really get visibility on anything. Not to mention also the sustainability impact that this has in terms of how much paper documentation uh, needs to actually uh, be be printed, be discarded every uh, every year. So it's all in all not a great situation that that is legally required. So what do you, how do you guys see this uh, move now with UK being let's say let's say the the pioneer or one of the pioneers in adopting such uh, legislation? Do you see other uh, countries also now following? I know UK is also a very big. Uh, um country for for uh setting kind of these disputes the uh the uh that are um, related to global trade so how do you see this moving in the next uh, year two three I, I personally believe it's uh you know it's a uh, um long overdue i mean it's just staggering to think that uh in 2023 to move a shipping container from you know from one side of the world to the other side of the world requires crazy amounts of paperwork to be physically, um, you know, so you ship a container on ship, but you're actually flying the paperwork in advance to the other side of the world to, for customs to clear that same physical paperwork, which is just crazy as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but to your point about the UK and the external uh, legislative drivers, I think the UK's uh, move towards the Electronic Trade Document uh, Act um, is 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 significant globally because you know in excess of sixty percent of of disputes, as you say, so contracts are written in English law and disputes are are obviously um, addressed in UK courts. So for the UK to take this uh, this position in terms of effectively facilitating the uh, you know electrification or sorry making trade documents. Um, uh, non-paper based um, is 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 a big big move, considering the volumes that they handle globally. Yeah, yeah. Ken, any thoughts on that one? Uh, I mean, this is really more David's uh, arena than than mine. All, all I would say is that <clears throat> if you look at the way that the um, ports, the the major ports around the world are all connected electronically. Back in the day, I was um, responsible for helping some of the ports in the UK get going back in the 1980s uh, electronically. So the information can move around instantly. But then, as David says, thanks to legal convention, going back centuries in some cases, uh, it's irrelevant unless the paper document, or more importantly, a paper document with a signature on. So there's someone to throw in jail if it goes wrong. Just makes a mockery of the whole thing. And to a large degree, um, the, the industry has bypassed that until something goes wrong and then you get into a legal dispute. That's when these conventions come into play. So the fact that they're now being digitized is, is excellent. I, I'm very sanguine about um, some of the initiatives uh, in to, to try and control the digital world. I'm, I'm not really sure a lot of the more recent things are, are that well informed, but in the case of the electronic e the e-bill, e that's a different thing, and, and that is to be welcomed and encouraged. And as David said, most people don't appreciate um, the role that um, the UK plays by virtue of English law being driven from here that underpins vast swathes of global trade and the fact that in a lot of countries around the world their legal system is based on English law so um, it's it's about time that this stuff has happened so it's great that it has yeah 
yeah that's uh, it's a very fair point and it's uh coincidentally right happening with also the rise and quick very quick development and adoption of ai technologies right around uh, a lot of industries i would say uh, many many industries are uh, are already significantly benefiting from it i i would say that uh, supply chains and international trade is a bit of a laggard in that case and uh reason probably for this is uh, is really the issues that you mentioned before, both of you, right? So you need to have um, trusted data that you can run AI applications on. You need The data needs to be connected across different organizations, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands, uh, thousands. And you need to also be able to interpret the data. So the systems need to understand the data and they need to be able to trust it, right? So the data needs to be verifiable. And I think that's where um why let's say not where but why the um the industry has been not been able to reap let's say that all of the benefits that ai um has to offer and um very happy that we're seeing things moving in a direction uh where where such such things are possible right and where origin trail the technology really can actually come in and shine because this is exactly what uh, what what origin trail was built for right for connecting um, verifiable trusted data uh, from across organizations and then being able to be uh, fed into various AI systems to do various different things, some of which we'll look into uh, into today in the live demo, and I'm, I'm looking forward to showing that. But uh, all in all, I think there is enormous potential, right, to be unlocked, uh, even, even with simple, let's say, digitalization and having connected data and then um, taking AI into account as well, I think the the possibilities are really uh, really enormous. So before we go into that, maybe before we go into into say more detailed uh, um, demo and and uh, an introduction into origin trail, maybe uh, some last sentences on the topics of of uh, AI in in supply chains. If uh, you guys have any, oh, DM. The only thing, well, there are several things I'll say, but the one thing to I think people should focus on, there's always been a tendency when technology is introduced to an area to then start thinking about the, applica the implications um, based on what's gone before and the way the world is now. That's, you know, a car, essentially a horse powered by fossil fuels or, or whatever rather than rethinking how you could move to mass transportation and so on. <clears throat> and I think the same is true with AI. There's a tendency to think of AI and its application uh, as a way of augmenting many of the things we do now. One of the interesting things about Origin Trail and the application of AI to the potential of Origin Trail it gives the opportunity to rethink how things are done in terms of manufacturing, supply chain operations, and whatever. So people shouldn't get locked. I know it's very easy to do this. They shouldn't restrict their imagination to, okay, this is what we did before, only this time it's in color. It's You're going to be doing stuff in a totally different way once you consider in, in the round what this means. That's that's the best way that I can describe this. Well, uh, from yeah. my point of view, I've been pretty lucky that I've been involved with um, several projects now, uh, proof of concepts and live projects with uh, the Origin Trail guys. And um, uh, I've been, I've, ha I've had the benefit of uh, being able to play with the uh, uh, AI, the semantic searches, et cetera, and apply it uh, in the context of my expertise around resilience, around supply chain security, managing risk, et cetera. And the only word that I can describe is, I think we're just scratching the surface. It's, it's blowing my mind how this could be applied and utilized within organizations, uh, cooperatively between organizations, um, and, you know, private sector, public sector uh, interfaces as well. So, um, yeah, it, it's just, I believe we're just truly scratching the surface in terms of the potential application for, for this. Great. Um, yeah, so 
thanks thanks for the those uh, uh, those thoughts i think best now we just go into a quick introduction of uh of what the origin trail is on a uh, on a high level so that uh, uh that everybody understands what's kind of going on behind the scenes in the demo so i'll quickly just share my screen and and run through some uh some presentation one second can you just give me the thumbs up that the screen is back all right two thumbs up that's great uh so origin trail really um we really believe so also based on what we just discussed right so uh we believe that in an overflow of misinformation trusted data becomes the cornerstone or a cornerstone of humanity security and prosperity and that applies not only to international trade it applies to uh, all industries it applies to uh to to every every side of uh, uh every side uh, of of any anything that we do essentially right so that being said with that paradigm in mind we also believe that knowledge is a new asset class and the origin troll is a way to enable organizations individuals to really seize that uh and and drive value from uh from knowledge now how do we do that how does origin trail enable that um, it's by allowing organizations to transform their data into something we call knowledge assets. And what are knowledge assets? Knowledge assets are really containers of structured data that have some very unique and cool characteristics that makes them incredibly valuable in uh, in the context such as we uh, discussed before, so supply chains, international trade. Uh, also, uh, a various number of other industries, but since the focus is uh, today on this, we're going to, to focus on international trade. But maybe just a quick introduction. So um, knowledge assets are, like I said, structured containers of uh, containers of structured data that live on the origin trail knowledge graph. And one of the characteristics they have is that they have they can be owned. So organizations that issue data, um, they can verify. So everyone can verify that a certain organization has actually issued that particular knowledge asset, meaning the data that it contains. And um, it also comes accompanied with a um, NFT, which means that ownership can also be transferred. So when we're talking about uh, in international trade documents, bill of lading, where, uh, you know, bill of lading being a document of title needs to be transferred uh, amongst across different parties as the shipment moves along, um, this becomes also very valuable because then you can have a verifiable trail of ownership uh, as to who owned um, a specific so bill of lading or a specific trade document at what point in time, what updates they made to it and all the things related to this. So this is a really powerful characteristic. Um, the other one is uh, they are uh, the knowledge assets are discoverable. Um, so they're like I said, knowledge assets live on the um, in the public decentralized knowledge graph. That doesn't mean that the data is public. Of course, data is is very usually uh, um, so data on international trade is usually very sensitive. So uh, origin trail. Uh, uh, Knowledge assets will give you full flexibility in terms of what should be shared publicly, what should not be shared publicly, what should be just be shared with certain trade partners. But the point is that because they're discoverable, they have this unique asset locator UAL. Um, they can uh, easily be found and they can be connected to other knowledge assets, right? From within one organization, from within multiple organization, individuals. So you get this web of connected knowledge assets um, that no single centralized database essentially could uh, uh, could hold. So that's the discovery discovery part of it, and uh, the third part, the th third characteristic being uh, verification. So as I mentioned before, you can always verify for each knowledge asset um, who issued it, um, what was the um, history, let's say the status updates of it. So meaning when was it updated, by whom was ownership transferred. All of this is verifiable in blockchain. Um, so you have that certainty at, at any point in time. David, you also mentioned before uh, uh, things around insurance and all these things, very important when it comes to uh, uh, to insurance paperwork to have things that are verifiable that you can prove, right? Uh, so that's just one one aspect uh, in international trade that is that this applies to very strongly. Um, and because they have all of these three characteristics, they can then be consumed by AI systems because there is that this data is considered trusted, right? You know exactly where it came from. Uh, you can verify it, and uh, it, it's it's uh, interconnected across many many organizations, giving you that full three hundred sixty degree view. So that's in principle, right? The those are the, the characteristics of knowledge asset. What does this mean in terms of, or in more specific context of uh, global supply chains and international trade? 
Well, knowledge assets can be anything in uh, related to national trade. It can be trade documents like bills of lading, CMR documents, uh, airway bills, you name it, right? Everything can be issued as a knowledge asset. It can be supply chain events uh, that uh, talk about what happened to a particular shipment or particular container or set of containers at what point in time. Uh, there can be IoT readings uh, that uh, give us, you know, temperature indications, shock indications, indication that uh, um, whether containers were compromised or not. We can attach geographic risk ratings based on where the shipment was, uh, so that the customs agents, for example, know is it risky for me to live uh, to to put uh, to uh, fast track the shipment through uh, the border, or should I actually, you know, stop and check because it went through some risky areas. Um, putting company audits as well, company certification. So all of these things that help understand the context uh, of what's going on with uh, either a shipment, a set of shipments, a particular company, um, and also other supply chain data, anything from you know sustainability indicators, proofs, uh, anything can become uh, part of this interconnected set of knowledge assets that are, of course, also based on certain standards such as GS1, W3C, the, the UN, uh, UNECE, so... There's a lot of um, things that go, a lot of global data standards that go into these to make them interconnected, to make them interoperable and ready for consumption, essentially, by the AI systems, which is the most exciting part. And that's what we're going to have a look at now uh, in the demo. So let me just close the presentation and I will you see refresh the pages. So make sure that I'm logged in uh, and I'll hide the video panel. Yeah. Um, so what we're looking at now uh, is the network operating system. So the network operating system in a nutshell is just a um, very easy way. Uh, it's a Trace Labs product that, it's, uh, that enables organizations to very easily connect their systems to, uh, uh, to the origin trail decentralized knowledge graph and create knowledge assets from their data. So it attracts a lot of complexity, makes it very easy in a couple of clicks, you can start creating knowledge assets. So for this particular demo, we have the knowledge assets already created and I'll just open, I'll go into the knowledge assets vault where we have all of these knowledge assets for the demo. And I'll, um, let me just delete this, the wrong paste. I'll just find the ECMR document uh, very quickly since I know the UAL. So I will find the ECMR document and I will open it just make this a little bit larger and uh as this loads this is the ecmr so the ecmr document is the document that is required in uh european union and some other countries um uh, to be presented as uh, a, a document for trucking so when you truck a shipment the ecmr document essentially specifies uh, what's in the shipment, who are the involved trade parties and all these uh, related things. So uh, what are the, the, what is the equipment use, containers and all these things. And here we can really see, for example, uh, we can see, um, let me zoom in on some of the, the things. So we can see who the uh, uh, involved parties were, uh, were, for example, this is the, um, just put it here. So this is the consigner trade party, right? So this, these are the guys that send something and we can see details around those. We can see uh, um, we can see who, for example, is the consignee. So consignee trade party. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of things, and this is just one knowledge asset which represents the document. Then we can see that a lot of other knowledge assets, which are these uh, hexagons, are connected to it. Right. So we can see there is a company, Logix Transporters, that uh, that uh, transported that issued this uh, ECMR, and I clicked on it. I actually. Um, get more details around that company. And as I open it up, I can see, okay, this company has, uh, yeah, it has a certain name, has a certain, uh, uh, let's go here, so it has a certain address, postal address, and they also have two credentials that have, they have attached to them as uh, as a representation of, uh, of, a, of a knowledge asset. So we can see here that they actually have a credential that is coming from the UK government, so I can open it up. So I can see that this is actually an AEO certificate, AEO authorization certificate issued by the uh, by the uh, HMRC, so the Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Um, can see when it was issued. Can see what type of AEO certificate it is. So AEO for customs, and um, uh, I can see when also obviously it was issued because we have all of the um knowledge assets uh, status updates here so when it was created when it was updated i can also look 
into this uh, in, in a more, let's say, structured way, not through the graph so that I can see it in, a, in an easier way. So you can see um, uh, who, who, who the issuer was and then the actual content of the certificate, which is uh, the A authorization. It was issued on the uh, 17th of January, 2021. And uh, uh, it's it's an AOC type of authorization. So that's that's uh, one of the credentials that the um, the transporters have assigned. The other one, for example, is an AO audit uh, issued by BSI, so AO self audit that the company uh, made. This is a huge knowledge assets, for example. So we can open it up and we can see how the graph as we open these interconnected knowledge assets really starts going bigger and bigger and bigger. And there is a lot of information in here, um, which is a great solid base, right? But this is a very complex thing to look at. So if you look at this, you can't really um, uh, make uh, make uh, heads or tails of it because it's, it's a lot of data. And this is really where then the AI component comes in. So we have all of these things connected, uh, verifiable, uh, a lot of data. Now, how do we you know, abstract this complexity and enable anyone, any participant in the supply chain to uh, to actually explore this. And this is where um, this little interface with uh, uh, which we call Chat VKG uh, comes into play. So this is a AI powered search and chat interface that is connected actually to the knowledge bank that we looked at here. So to all of these knowledge assets uh, that uh, that are issued for this demo use case, uh, and it enables us to ask natural questions. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, ask one question, one of the, the, the suggested questions, for example, which trade parties are involved in shipment with the shipment number? And uh, what's happening now is that the, uh, uh, the AI engine is essentially looking for through all of these knowledge assets in there, uh, trying to find that shipment number uh, and, and giving us uh, giving us the answer to the question who is involved. Now, what you see on the screen is a couple of things. We have uh, the original question that we asked, and you can see here we actually have search and chat mode. And this is a cool thing because we can uh, we can do a couple of things with search and chat. So search mode really is an extractive AI component, if you will, um, that looks at all of the knowledge assets uh, and finds the knowledge assets and components of knowledge assets with the highest relevance to the post question and returns them unedited in their original state as they are in um, in the uh, in the knowledge assets. And then we have chat mode, which essentially finds this and also sends it to a large language model, which is an, uh, essentially an AI processor that um, summarizes this and, and makes it, let's say, a more chat, more user, uh, user readable way. So here in search mode, we can see that we returned, we got returned all of the answers to our questions. Who's the consigner? Who's the consignee? Who's the carrier? But now if we submit the same question in chat mode, we'll get um, a slightly nicer, uh, nicer looking answer. Because um, this input that we saw up, uh, up here essentially is getting fed to the large language model to provide a more summarized answer, right? So he puts in a little group uh, groups to say trade parties involved in shipments are consigner, the address, carrier, and consignee. Now that's one exciting thing that the interface allows. The other and the more say the the more important thing is that for each of the answers, you can see all of the source knowledge assets that the answer was based on. And not only can you see them, you can also directly explore them. So if I want to, for example, see, aha, uh -huh, okay, this is the ECMR document where this answer was uh, based on, I can click on it and it will take me, this is the same CMR document that we looked at before in, in, the, in the NOS, but it will take me to it and I can see and I can verify all the content if I wanted to. The same with all of the others. And I can see also who issued each of the, each of the, the source knowledge assets. So for example, these are, knowledge assets that represent organizations. This is a knowledge asset that rep represents CMR. And you can see that we have different issuers for those. So the ECMR was issued by the transport provider. And uh, that's kind of the how the mechanism works. Uh, and we asked a very simple question now. Now we can go a little bit further and say, OK, so we asked which uh, trade parties are involved. Let's ask which trade parties have an AEO certification, because that's important. AEO, the authorized economic operator, means that they have certain benefits when importing uh, or exporting out of a certain country. And uh, there we go. So the trade party involved in the shipment has the AO certification is Logix Transporters. And we can see 
also a link actually to the certificate, which is the knowledge asset of that uh, of that AEO certificate for logic tra logic transporters issued by the HMRC. And we can view again the source element. We can view it. We can see the how the certificate looks like. And I'll just show it quickly so you guys can see. It's what we looked at before, but now only opening that particular knowledge asset. So you can see this is for. Uh, logic transporters. It's uh, an AOC certificate. This is when it was issued. This is the uh, the AO type, and of course, it's connected also to the uh, organization knowledge asset, which is um, logic transporters, right? And so you can see how this connection also works from different angles when you come um, when you come in. But the important piece is you always get to see uh, all of the source knowledge assets, and you get to verify them. Now, going into something more, let's say, um, complex, uh, um, than, than more, more complex than simply asking um, which parties were involved, which ones have certification, we can also ask, for example, what was the route that the, the shipment uh, actually took? So what happens now? Again, the, the AI will go through all of the knowledge assets. It will try to find if there are any uh, GPS coordinates that were attached to this particular shipment and it will return a visual representation on a map. So we can see this shipment started at geolocation this, ended the geolocation this, and we can see on the map exactly where that particular shipment uh, uh, traveled based on the IoT data, right? So in this case, we can see it went from Spain via France and into the UK. And then what usually happens, right? So we have... Uh, Ask some basic questions around. We know where the shipment uh, went through. We know who is particip has participated in the shipment. Now, what we'd like to know a little bit more about, for example, what are the risk components of these countries that the shipment went through? And uh, I can ask, I'll just copy paste the answer because it's a little bit about a longer question. Um, so we can ask, we can ask what are the risk ratings for, for example, unmanifested cargo introduction, which is one of the risk categories that BSI's uh, risk, uh, geographic risk uh, knowledge assets have uh, for the countries that the shipment passed through. So in our case, that's Spain, France, it's UK. And I'm going to switch to search mode just so that you see how this one is actually displayed when it's returned uh, in a table format, um, because there's uh, uh, these are very, let's say, straightforward, simple ratings. So we can see here that the unmanifested cargo risk score for France, Spain, United Kingdom. So United Kingdom, very low. Uh, Spain, uh, the highest of the three, and France, somewhere in between. So you can really you know, dig deeper and, and, and really ask questions around the shipment that is um, uh, that goes from basic things, who is who was in the shipment, to really uh, complex things, or what was the you know, what was the risk with the ship associated with the shipment based on all of the data that we have. And I'll ask one last question um, that is interesting that I'll say um, related to the IoT. So I will ask uh, a question of um, what was the highest and average temperature in the container, right? So this is also very important, especially when it's temperature controlled cargo, um, also related to insurance and, and whatnot, uh, that, for example, uh, the container, the temperature in the container doesn't exceed um, a certain, uh, a certain uh, threshold. So I'll switch back to chat mode and we'll ask this and the same thing will happen. Going through all of the shipments, all of the knowledge assets and finding if there's anything on temperature that is associated with sensor on this container. And there we go. So we get the highest temperature was 19.9 uh, .9 degrees Celsius, where the average uh, was 15.1. And we also get a, a chart of, uh, of the IoT data that uh, where we got this from. Again, also all of the knowledge assets, everything, uh, or source knowledge assets, everything is here, everything is verifiable. So we asked five questions now, I think, uh, uh, went through quite quite a couple of things that, uh, or understanding what you can ask, what, uh, what the, the, this type of AI powered interface can do. Maybe I'd hand over the word, uh, Ken, to you and David uh, to, to maybe provide some more context. What does this mean in the real world? You know, what, what, what can we do now when if I'm an organization and I can do this for my supply chain, what does this mean for me? What is the impact? Well, <clears throat> a, a simple example, um, <clears throat> depending on the the, um, the participants on this call, the people watching this, if they're from the logistics arena, uh, if you take um, an, an incident such as what happened with the Ever Given a couple of years ago, where that large container ship um, decided to 
do some unauthorized parking across the Suez Canal. Uh, the, it snarled up global supply chains for a week or, or two. Um, and the, the knock on economic impact was colossal. What very few people actually saw, apart from um, people in the industry, particularly the insurance industry, was trying to understand the impact on the shipments that were on that vessel, because it was a huge container ship, something like 21, 22,000 containers uh, on that ship, each containing you know, tens of thousands of individual shipments. Um, who, who would be impacted? How long... Um, if it was for critical supply chains, time critical supply chains, could you get replacement parts in? Could you have to fly them in because they couldn't travel by sea? Because by blocking the Suez Canal, other ships couldn't get through. Um, if all of that information was available on the knowledge graph, you could have gone to the knowledge graph and say, OK, show me the vessel, the knowledge asset, the vessel. And then all of the assets and information associated with that, the containers, the contents, um, where it was going next, who the shippers were, who the consignees were, all of the information, the IoT, Internet of Things information, if they had temperature sensors, for example, in any of the containers, sitting there in the bright sunshine, maybe no power. So therefore, the air conditioning wasn't working in the containers and it was temperature critical shipments. All of that in one place. Instead, what really happened, everyone had to try talking to each other, gathering the information from their separate information systems. It actually took six months to sort all this out. And at the end of it, the insurance industry declared a thing called general average, which basically meant some of it got screwed up, and unfortunately, all of you are going to have to share the cost of that. <clears throat> now, that's the, in a very, very small example of the power of what we've been looking at here. This is very nascent and um, really just giving you a snapshot of the implications for this in terms of global supply chain operations. Far beyond that is the kind of stuff that David references, which is risk insurance finance and so on so that's really what this is all about yeah i mean i, I absolutely echo everything you've said there ken uh but to give it sort of real context i mean uh, both you and i know yuri that this is this you know this information is from uh real shipments uh we monitored this and from my point of view uh i'm thinking just what you've just showed there, the functions within an organization. We're talking about one shipment, one container being moved from one location, so from our origin destination to another country, uh, sorry, origin to destination. And typically to monitor this shipment from a risk point of view within an org risk and uh, operational and quality point of view within an organization, you will have siloed functions within an organization. So you will have the security guys doing their own assessment of what the risk is to that shipment. You'll have the quality people doing exactly the same on a different system. You'll have the transportation management organization or the you know logistics organization doing very similar things on another system. Imagine one organization, one shipment, one enterprise system, assets of the container, assets of the consignee, sorry, you know, all the participants in, in the shipment, et cetera, uh, and an interface, an AI interface within that company where the quality people can ask the question, so what were the temperature variants during the shipment? The security guys can say, were we exposed to any risk in France? Uh, the transportation management logistics guys can ask, were there any stops? Where were the stops? Uh, the customs broker aspects of the uh, organization, the function can ask the question, okay, so I need this information for um, you know, uh, customs brokerage. Boom, they have that information to hand in one system. The, the power of this is just, as I said to you, uh, and I, I say to everybody I meet, the power of this is just, uh, we're scratching the surface here from a, you know, a, an application to really change the way that we manage supply chains. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with both of you. It's uh, And even though that's the amazing part, right? Even though it's such a nascent piece of technology, 
um, it's already so you can already get so much value out of it, right? So the potential that is still to be unlocked, uncovered, um, and, and this is the law of network effects here as well, right? The more knowledge assets you have, the more information that you have, the more things you can ask, the more value you can get out of it. So I'm also very excited to see this. I mean, even if I look at the last three months of how we progressed with this, right, to the stage where we are now, I'm really looking forward to the next three months and the next six months to see this this developing because it's a very um, it's a very very powerful piece of technology and I think especially for the international trade for the supply chain industry where data is really so fragmented like you said not only across organizations even within organization right so I'm well familiar with that as well um, what yeah what 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 can really be done. Uh, sorry, David, you wanted to add something. No, I was just going to say, I think a really important part of the network effect, you know, I, I focus very much from an internal functional, organizational functional point of view. How do we improve that? But actually, if you think about it, and Ken made the point here about protection of competitive information, but there's a lot of information out there that can be commonly shared for mutual benefit. And if we can connect that up, you know, and you're the owner of that information, that data, then you know that's uh, benefit it mutually benefits everybody involved in the supply chain but it will invariably financially benefit the owner of the data that facilitates the benefit of the whole supply chain uh, supply chain participants so that's where i see this going definitely very powerful yeah. absolutely yeah it's uh and i'm sure there are a lot of you know, very, very powerful use cases that uh, are yet to be discovered, right? And this is this is the great thing with uh, also working with you guys is that uh, as we work on these things uh, on real life cases, right? Uh, that's where you really get the input uh, that needed to refine uh, these these use cases. And I mean, all of these questions and all of these are based, like you said, they're based on, uh, of course, this is dummy data, but it's based on real shipment, right? Because again, uh, all of this would be uh, in in a real life scenario would be private data, right? So it wouldn't be publicly available, publicly visible. Um, but this just goes to show also the versatility of how knowledge assets and AI search can work, because all of these um, public uh, private knowledge assets could also be connected to public knowledge assets. For example, weather data. For example, any type of open data that is out there uh, available publicly. You know, sustainability reports of of companies that are uh, involved in shipments. There's uh, so many possibilities, and then the more you connect, the more interesting questions you can ask. And I'm really, you know, I'm really curious to see what type of questions we'll be asking in uh, in three months, in half a year, in a year, um, oh. and and what the answers are that we're going to be getting. And and this this goes back to the point I made right at the start of uh, this presentation that. Um, the notion that uh, there would be one company that had one database that was managing one supply chain comprising thousands of companies and trading partners and whatever, and you'd have all that information in that one database was an absurdity because you could never construct something like that. That's why you required a solution like this that exploits network effects to connect huge numbers of different data sources, uh, different applications with data stores involved and so on. So it's essentially like when you go to the opticians, they try various lenses out on you. So, and as you get closer to your right prescription, everything becomes clearer. And as you connect more and more of these data sources in context and use a mechanism such as this to expose them, then you get much, much more clarity and fidelity as to what's going on within your operations. And that literally starts from procuring raw material through manufacturing, through packaging, shipping, assembly, final delivery, and then the return and repair cycle. That's true supply chain visibility, which is something that very, very few organizations are even close to being able to achieve now. That's why this notion is so powerful because it's a community approach and a network approach to a very, very complicated problem that on the surface seems very trivial, but in practice is phenomenally complex. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that, is, that is well put, right? Also, supply chains tend to be uh, thought of as linear linear kind of uh, chains, right? Whereas they're really networks of, of businesses, of government yeah. organizations, 
legislators. So all of these things put together and uh, you need to have a, um, let's say the technology backbone that can support this type of uh, openness, this type of uh, uh, network, this type of sharing. So, um, and this is also how Origin Trail at the end of the day was developed, right? Starting from uh, uh, from from that basic uh, basic concept of supply chains to really growing into uh, into this network where you can really connect everything. Yeah. Um, and maybe maybe if I go into just uh, I have been in, in we're starting to uh, get close to the uh, close to the end. So maybe just one last slide that we um, that we partially already covered. Um, is uh, you know this is a very like we said nascent technology. It's uh, it's it's uh, very new. There's a lot of things still to come. But just imagine the potential of of uh, what can be done when this is uh, you know uh, implemented properly. When when we have network effects. So not only just the questions that we ask, but ask things you know wider sustainability. What is the environmental impact of my last one hundred ocean freight shipments? How does it benchmark against the industry? You could uh, ask things around, you know, safe and ethical labor. How many suppliers have plans to ensure ethical labor practices, fair wages, safe working conditions in their operation and get a, a trusted or verifiable answer there. Um, also around the security, right? So what's my least secure warehouse location based on the, all of the geographic risk and cargo theft incident rates? So these are just kind of some things to spark imagination, uh, not to be limited only to the things that we saw uh, in the demo today. Um, and and that kind of being said, maybe uh, in the interest of time, then Ken and, and David, maybe some closing thoughts from you both, and uh, then we can call it a day, I guess. <clears throat> okay, I'll start because I've drone on the most. Um, <clears throat> the technology is really, really, really interesting, and the team have done a fantastic job. That's not the issue because the technology is going to get better, things are going to improve. This is very threatening to a number of organizations and relationships between organizations. Within organizations, <clears throat> you have particularly very large organizations been there, done that, got several T-shirts. Um, <clears throat> they have internal operations, product plans and so on, and essentially corporate hierarchies that are focused around an information systems, an information systems architecture and an approach, particularly if they're involved in management and uh, um, manufacturing or logistics, that revolves around first off opening up their own information systems to work with or collaborate with their trading partners. And they've probably taken years to get to this point. What we're looking at here is essentially supercharged what they're trying to address, probably beyond any timescale that they thought they would have to, to do this. So this is very, very threatening because it's a new way of looking at the problem rather than trying to expand their empire by, um, <clears throat> you know, getting building larger and larger software applications, um, data models running massive databases. This is very challenging because it's a completely different approach. <clears throat> so there's that. Between companies, a lot of companies, make, in, particularly in supply chains, act as gatekeepers. Who gets to see information and share it? Something like this is terrifying because essentially it opens up the floodgates for different people to be able to, to go and find the information for themselves or for an AI to go and find something. And when people that like to control access to information lose access to that information or someone else is able to do it at no cost um, and gains no benefit by sharing that, that's also very scary. So to prevent this, the adoption or accelerated adoption of this kind of technology and this kind of approach, there'll be those um, roadblocks that will crop up from time to time. That being said, I think this approach is inevitable because if you've had to deal with these problems in real life, you understand why this approach makes so much sense. But the time this is going to take is indeterminate. I'd like to see it happen within the next five to 10 years. It may take much longer or we may get an enlightenment and it happens much quicker. 
But I think, which is why I got involved in the first place, I think this is very, very profound about how you manage and access information in global supply chains and pretty much anything connected with the way the world makes things, moves things, buys things and, and conducts itself. Speech over. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> David, over to you. But you're on mute. <laughs> my apologies. Um, in summary, uh, from my point of view, Yuri, I, I think if you factor in all the uh, in external um, aspects to this in terms of post-pandemic, uh, changing the way that we do supply chain uh, globally, uh, geopolitical issues, legislation being driven down the way of um, you know, uh, utilisation of, of data, um, uh, and legislation driving towards uh, organizations, commercial organizations, ensuring that their their supply chain is um, good from an ESG point of view, uh, good from um, you know uh, sustainability and security point of view. And also, if you then look at the uh, large global multinational organizations' annual reports, just take a sample over the last eighteen months, have a look at their annual reports do a quick control F search around supply chain, around uh, uh, risk management, and every organization is cognitive of the, the, the management of the supply chain, the application and compliance with the a ESG um, uh, legislation, uh, uh, yeah, legis yeah, legislation that has been introduced or is already in place, uh, and organizations are you know, moving in this direction. Uh, what I get on a uh, regular basis is, well, how do we do this? How do we do this? Uh, and I see that this is the way that we do things. Um, and, and the more that we introduce it to uh, organizations, the more that we share, the more that we communicate, then, you know, I think that we are um, uh, well down the track. We're, we're down the track. And I think we're, we're all obviously on a journey, but we're well down the track. And to get to a tipping point, I think, there's a lot of things happening that will, will I think, will make this uh, this tipping point nearer than than five years like easily. I, I think it's just going to happen. It has to happen. Yeah. Thanks, David. Hopefully, yeah. And I think things are accelerating rapidly, uh, especially with the. Uh, I think yeah, the artificial intelligence AI has a lot to do with it. I think because it's uh, sparked a lot of. Uh, innovation across all of the industries and i think legislation is trying to catch up so uh fingers crossed also also from my side that this uh, uh industry-wide adoption happens sooner uh sooner than than we uh we estimate but uh, only time will tell i guess so yep. in the meanwhile we we carry on uh doing our part right to uh, uh to spread the awareness to spread the solutions to uh to to uh and provide value to organizations that are already kind of you know uh willing to to take on such undertakings so which is great uh I'm always happy to see these things um, um okay yeah david go ahead i i noticed there's an anonymous anonymous attendee in the there's a question asked if ah. we put one minute there um i think and it's a really important question uh, from a continuity perspective, can the systems create alerts for the consequences of any preceding events? For example, a port delay impacting forward transit or an expiration of goods, etc. Um, I think it really is worthwhile, Yuri, mentioning that within the GS1 standard, there are a number of different protocols that can be used to provide effectively risk management by exception. So it notifies, notifies me, for example, when things uh, that I expect to happen don't happen. So you can you can definitely build in notifications to allow you to take actions, which is you know back to Ken's point about increasing visibility, increasing transparency, allowing you to make better decisions. Yep. Yeah, good good call on the on the questions, David. I think it somehow slipped my mind. Uh, we do have another question, which is uh, I think it was already answered. Um, uh, from from Sasha, so coming from industry professionals like you, so referring to Ken and David, um, this has to be like inventing the electricity or the first phones. <laughs> this enables pretty much anything to be monitored in real time. It's mind blowing. 
Um, so I guess we covered this already, but uh, I don't know, Ken, if you wanna, if you have some more thoughts uh, on, uh, on on that, feel free to share. Otherwise, we can. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's some very very clever applications already being used uh, across the industry that do alar alarms, alerts, all kinds of proactive notifications. But this this mechanism provides a much richer. Um, information source not only to that but to pretty much every system that's involved um, but you've just got to rethink how things are done um, the, the potential that this unleashes um, and if you're feeding assuming we get to the stage where AIs are not hallucinating um, AIs will just take away a lot of this stuff because they'll see I did some stuff several years ago in the aerospace industry um, where manufacturing fan blades in jet engines, which is a pretty complex um, process, knowing when the raw material is going to be available, this is X months prior to that, which is pretty critical when you're building something that's using critical resources. Um, knowing in advance that there's going to be a delay and then being able to proactively plan to get around that to make sure you still meet the right um, delivery date for for that um jet engine was actually you know hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, that are tied up in that being able to exploit the transparency that this the origin trail um reveals is um will dramatically transform operations like that dramatically so we just have to rethink once this really gets going how we can do things in a much more enhanced and efficient and effective way. But we're, as David said earlier, we're just scratching the surface. You know, this is this is like finding the first um, <clears throat> dial on your first phone. Okay, now who do I call? We're at the now who do I call stage. Yeah, that's that's a good uh, good way of putting it, Ken. Thanks. And you mentioned one one uh, thing that uh, will be also my my closing thought around the uh, AI and hallucinations, right? So um, combining this approach uh, that we use here with um, knowledge assets and uh, extractive uh, extractive methods of AI with large language models to essentially um, uh, use this extractive input to summarize to to do something with it also significantly reduces and uh, in, in the future uh, most likely completely eliminates um, the uh, hallucination uh, probability of the AI hallucinating because the AI, so the LLM in this case, and that's why we have the search and chat mode, right? Search mode will never hallucinate. It's impossible because it finds stuff that are in the, the knowledge assets. Whereas chat mode, um, uh, it really, the, so the large language model gets fed a really limited uh, already uh, context that has probably the answer in it, right? Because that's what the extractive piece found. So it has a lot less maneuvering space to hallucinate something. So it's a very, yeah, it's a very important point and thanks for reminding me. Um, but maybe then just um, to to wrap this up since we're a little bit over time, but I, I guess the, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks uh, to both Ken and, and David and uh, the participants, of course. Um, I'll end on a note uh, of uh, uh, that goes really well with what we discussed, right? Knowledge is power. Knowledge shared is power multiplied. So I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, seeing such solutions uh, as we have here used by uh, by by a lot of uh, participants, players in supply chains that really deliver value. You know, reduce uh, reduce environmental impacts and uh, everything else that comes along with it. So uh, thank you again for for joining. Thanks for the insights and. Uh, yeah, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, Yuri. Thanks a lot, Yuri. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.